Hey everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our second episode in our North Africa campaign on the World on Fire podcast. Your host as always, Nick Schweitzer. In our most recent episode, we really touched on where the state of the world, especially between the Germans and the British in 1942. And as we know, the Italians were not putting up the best of fights against the French on the Egyptian-Libyan border. Mussolini was able to bend Adolf Hitler and, of course, the OKW to hastily put together a fighting element to go be an aid to their allies. But this is odd, as we discussed, because the Germans were not interested at all at being an aid on the side or being in the background. They, they didn't want to be a reserve component to anything. But... The reason why they chose to do this is because the Germans understood the natural resources that laid underneath the sand in North Africa and ultimately the Middle East, on top of gaining the Suez Canal, would be pivotal in order for them to continue operating their war machine. We introduced the legendary desert and armored tactician, General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, uh, and he would single-handedly lead the attack against the British. As we discussed, after nearly gear fighting, the lines in the sand, unintended, had not truly moved in the battle. It was a battle of back and forth, if you will. Game of inches. We also came to the realization that the British would not need to wait any longer for the United States to join the fight as they were officially at war with both the Empire of Japan and Nazi Germany after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And we got to understand what the big deal is with Egypt, right? This past episode, this episode, all of it's really dealt with Libya, the advance out of Libya going into Egypt. In theory, right, the Axis powers now have control over Libya. Algeria, Tunisia, all of those former European colonies all now fall under the umbrella of Nazi Germany. There's one incredible piece of land, if you will. It's a waterway. A piece of water truly gives access to the natural resources in the Middle East. That's the Suez Canal. The 120 mile, 194 kilometer stretch of water provides the fastest and ultimately the shortest route from Europe to the Indian Ocean. With control of the Suez, the speed in which an army could resupply and replenish their oil would ultimately be the difference between life and death or an attacking military. By May and June of 1942, Erwin Rommel had set his sights directly on the canal. In order for us to truly understand the Battle of Alamein coming up, we must revisit the Battle of Mursa Matru, as it truly is the prelude to this fight. Alamein was the fallback position and the defensive position at Mersa Matru. And the defensive positions at Mersa Matru had not planned at stopping the advance of the Germans. It was just simply to slow them down. So ultimately, Alamein was the defensive fighting position. It was the ultimate fallback. It was where they were going to fight. And the British knew this. General Auchinleck, as we had brought up in the last episode, also planned to move his troops from Mursa Matru and move them to the nearby city of Fuka for a second defensive position. On the 26th of June, the Africa Corps' 90th Light Division and the 21st Panzer Division would elude through a minefield and begin to crush the British defenders. And by the late hours of the 27th, Auchinleck gave the order that all defenders were to retreat back to Fuka. However, those such as the 2nd New Zealand Division, retreat route would be severed, leaving them to find their way to Fuka on their own. 
Even at the city of Fuca, it was clear that the message Auchinleck had given was not received in time for everyone. The 10th Corps was totally scattered throughout Egypt and defenses of Alamein, the last stand for the British in Egypt. The, <laughs> the British in Cairo at this point are beyond friendly. They're firmly believing that Egypt is going to fall within the next couple of weeks. And they're not the only ones that believe that. Benito Mussolini actually flies to, to Tripoli in order to prepare for the victory parade in Egypt. The situation has become beyond dire. And it is apparent that the fight in Alamein is going to be the deciding factor for the fate in North Africa. Now, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the military, the, the total industrial, the military complex, if you will, in the United States immediately flipped. All industries flipped, the economy flipped, everything possible was geared towards mobilizing for war. Factories that were once pushing out automobiles began producing tanks, planes, and guns. All of America was going to war, either literally, or in a factory, or in other ways, such as buying war bonds or planning victory gardens. It was at this point in the war, the Soviet Union are on an all-out offensive against the Germans. And they're fighting for their lives in the East. It's clear to everybody involved, including President Roosevelt and Chief of Staff George C. Marshall, my mistake, General George C. Marshall, that this cross-channel invasion needed to happen as soon as possible. The British, on the other hand, knew exactly what the Americans had in store for them. Got to remember, the British had been fighting them already for two and a half years at this point. The Germans aren't simply going to fall down just because the Americans show up. Hell, by this point, the Germans have basically defeated every great military power and completely shattered most of them. This was not going to be some fast operation that the Americans would simply walk into Berlin. They needed to have the experience first. It's only once the British were defeated at Tobruk is when Roosevelt reached out to Churchill personally and asked how America could help. President Roosevelt made it clear that Americans would be taking the fight to the Germans in Africa in 1942. While the American invasion plans of North Africa were being crafted under the new leadership of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the U.S. Army Air Forces would quickly be trained and placed into action to help the British. The American help would have to wait, though. On June 30th, Erwin Rommel would be able to see the city of Alamein. But the Wehrmacht at this point had been drug on its face. The relentless push that Rommel demanded of his men was reaching its breaking point. The march across North Africa's desert was brutal on the German soldiers. Not only that, you can not only say the Germans made it as far as they did, taking heavy losses. 5,000 of them would be killed along this way. And Rommel is now faced with a pure tactical conundrum, right? Does he give the men time to rest, allowing the British to also, in theory, rest? Or does he take his already tired and under-equipped men through the British at Alamein? His choice was to go for it. Three divisions, the 90th Light, the 15th Panzer, the 21st Panzer Divisions were to penetrate British lines at Alamein and Deir el Abeg. On July 1st, after a slight delay, Rommel gave the order to attack Alamein. General Auchinleck's objective would be to funnel the Germans between the boxes set up by the British and crush them. The 18th Indian Infantry would be one of the first British units to face off against the Germans near Deir el Sheen holding the Germans off long enough so Achenleck could move his defense in the east at Ruistat Ridge. After defeating the Indian infantry, the 90th continued to move along the coast until being completely halted by the South African artillery. The 90th would again try the following down July 2nd, but they would be unsuccessful in their attempt. Not only that, 
the Desert Air Force had been hammering. The arrival of the 9th Australian Division would prove to be just what Auchinleck needed. And on July 10th, he ordered the Australians to take to German-held cities of Telekmatkad and Tel Aisa. And within 48 hours, they were successful. Auchinleck would launch Operation Bacon July 14th to destroy the Italian 17th Infantry at Ruistat Ridge, utilizing the New Zealand and Indian Infantry Divisions. He would later launch Operation Manhood, where he would attempt to move the 30th Corps to the north in order to cut Rommel's supply lines. Commencing on July 26th, the plan quickly fell apart. However, the German counteroffensive was beyond too much for the British attackers. And on the 31st of July, Aachen like officially ended his campaign. Digging in, the battle would end a stalemate. The victories and the losses on both sides, while Auchinleck succeeded in halting Rommel's push east, he had failed in driving them back. Auchinleck would be sacked after the first battle of El Amain. His Middle East commander in chief role going to General Harold Alexander. And his 8th Army command would go to a soon-to-be-famous General Bernard Montgomery. After the first battle of El Amain, both sides were weak, undersupplied, tired, and simply could not keep fighting. Luckily for the British, however, their equipment was being sent from England and the United States were starting to arrive in North Africa. One of the most important pieces of equipment to arrive was that of the Sherman tank. The British were quickly reorganizing and resupplying their men. Rommel on the other hand, was in a terrible situation. Running out of resources, he needed fuel more than anything. Nearly half of the Italian ships sailing through the Mediterranean at this point, attempting to resupply the Germans, would be sank. He needed to go on the advance quicker rather than later. And that was if he planned at defeating the British Eighth Army at all. He would need to lean on those friends that he had once had in the Luftwaffe, where he was finally able to convince General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring to spare enough fuel to make the operation worth it. Not necessarily work, but make the risk worth it. To the south of Alamein lay the cities of Munasib and Korat el Minima. Rommel believed that between these two cities was highly, lightly, my bad, was a lightly defended and lightly mined area of defense that would allow their tanks to navigate. Once the frontal assault would take place, the 90th, the 21st, and 15th divisions would then turn north through British minefields, completely encircling the 8th Army, thus leaving them to be destroyed. What Rommel did not know, however, is that the famous British ultra decrypts totally unraveled their plan and gave General Montgomery a tip off. It let him know what they were going to do. Under the command of Auchinleck, contingencies were in place to fall back to Alexandria and Cairo if the Germans kept advancing. However, once Monty saw these plans, and he scrapped them. The ultra decrypts told him what he needed to know. And he told his men to hold Elamane at all costs. Plans were moved so that the men would prepare for the impending battle to come from the south. Not only would they have more men, brand new tanks, they would also launch his attack in the city of Alam al Halfa. But before he could even attack, the RAF spotted the Axis and opened fire. Between the surprise attack from the air and the ambush at the lightly defended minefields, the Germans were being slaughtered. Not on the next day, however, Rommel and his troops made it through the minefield. Monty immediately called for his men to move in on their flank. It's here where over 600 tanks would square off. Most of them were British. The long-range Panzer IVs opened up, dealing massive amounts of damage. And in an attempt to outmaneuver the British, 
the Panzers would be destroyed by hidden anti-tank guns. The next morning on September 1st, the British and American bombers were back, specifically targeting supply lines. The Allies' attack was simply too strong for the Germans. On September 2nd, the OKW gave the order to withdraw the attack due to the lack of air superiority, lack of surprise, and shortage of supplies. Over the next couple of days, Germans and Italians would be pushed almost all the way back to the original lines. Rommel's anticipation would be that, just like Auchinleck, Monty would continuously send his men on the offensive. But he just didn't. You see, Monty realized that a lot of his troops were now green. They had weapons that had never been used. And his men needed supplies to win. For him, it made sense to make Alamein not only the staging area for the next battle, but it would be what he would make the next battle. Then six weeks after the last German offensive, the Allies were ready. And nearly 200,000 men, over 1,000 tanks ready to go. The British were ready to knock the Germans out of Egypt for once and for all. Monty planned a 16-day three-step plan. As he called it, they would break in, dogfight, and then break the enemy. Filled with illusions and tricks to throw the Germans off of where the main attacks would begin, on October 23rd, the British lines opened up with a nearly six-hour shelling, officially starting Operation Lightfoot. Infantry and engineer divisions would instantly go on the attack, with infantry leading the way, sappers following behind them in the minefields, sweeping as fast as possible to allow tanks through. Unfortunately, this was not successful, and there wasn't a single tank that made it through the minefields. Even though the tanks were unable to get through there, the 7th Armor made a successful attack in the south. The attack was a total shock to the Germans and the Italian HQs, and Rommel, who was at his sanatorium, was now urged to quickly return to North Africa after the man who replaced him had a heart attack. So he was asked to quickly get back and take control of his troops in North Africa. By October 25th, he reassumed his command. Now, at the same time on October 25th, the British successfully advanced through the minefields, but would face off against the heavily entrenched Germans near Miraria. It's here where it centered around the city of Telisa again. Upon Rommel's return to his troops in North Africa eventually, that's when he found his men exhausted, with only three days of fuel remaining. The situation not only worsened, but basically sealed their fate when a German oil tanker off the coast of Tobruk was hit by an Allied air attack and sank. Now, for General Montgomery, his sights are set on the coast road in the north. Within two days, the Australians would bake through near the coast road and beat back multiple German counterattacks, securing the next objective. It was at this point in which Rommel was beginning to sense defeat. He made the immediate plans to pull his troops all the way back to Fuca, nearly 50 miles away. The losses in the north at this point are substantial. General Montgomery commands Operation Supercharge, where his goal is to pull some of the diversionary forces from the south and move them to the north to replenish their main attack and finally break the German defense near Tel el Akal. The attack was immense, and the second New Zealand, along with the first armor, would meet heavy fire and stiff resistance. However, it would force Rommel to use all of his reserves, costing the Panzer unit dearly with over 100 tanks lost. As Monty continued to hammer the Germans back, Rommel hopelessly reached out to Hitler in Germany and asked for permission to withdraw his forces. Hitler was pissed. He immediately denied it. And they were told to hold their positions no matter what. With less than 50 tanks remaining, they were dwindling fast. Rommel ordered his men west, a full retreat against what Adolf Hitler had told him. And on the 4th of November, 
Montgomery, Montgomery would launch one more offensive, officially crushing the Italians and Germans in Egypt. By doing so, the British were successful in pushing Rommel all the way back to, you guessed it, once again, El Aguila in Libya. You all heard that before. But the British were in no shape to keep moving forward. Learning from the mistakes of past leaders, <coughs> Auchinleck and uh, Rommel, Montgomery decided to wait and allow his men to rest. He knew, however, though, that in four days on November 8th, he would get the fighting help he needed as Operation Torch would launch and his American brethren would be landing to help the fight. Now, in both battles of El Amain, they proved to be pivotal for the war. The first one in the stalemate, however, it brought General Montgomery to the field. It also brought General Harold Alexander, who we'll discuss later, into the field. But we all know who that how Montgomery's career plays out. The second battle is what was really the turning point for the war, the early part of the war for the Allies. Not only that, but it would also be the last time it was not a full Allied effort in defeating the Nazis. So on our next episode, we're going to look at the American landings in Algeria with the launch of Operation Torch. We're also going to look at the American failure at the Kasserine Pass, the Tunisian campaign, and the eventual landings on Sicily. What is going to make this next episode cool is that we're going to be doing a conversation with some of my fellow neighbors and friends to answer live questions, to have open conversations about the war during this time. As always, thank you all so much for listening. Um, so we did, in fact, cross our 750 listener mark that I talked about. Um, and in my original uh, notes here, I have that we're on our way to 800. Uh, before this show started, I looked and we were, I think, at 821. So we're well past that. We're on our way to 850, um, which is crazy to think about. And we're, you know, we're starting to smell 1000. So thank you guys so much for just turning in every two weeks, just listening to me ramble. Uh, I appreciate it. It means more than anything in this world. Uh, so please make sure you check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Search us World on Fire, a history of the Second World War podcast, where we post insights into our upcoming episodes, pictures, stories, and all other fun things our community likes to talk about. Once again, thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you in two weeks. Peace.